The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Welcome to Star Wars Ologies, the podcast about science and other academic fields of study seen in Star Wars. This time we have a very special episode. It is our Comic Con special edition panel of the science of Star Wars uh, recorded over Thanksgiving weekend in San Diego at Comic Con. Woo, Comic Con! I'm James Floyd. I am a freelance writer for StarWars.com and Star Wars Insider Magazine. And I'm the co host, Melissa Miller, and I am also a freelance writer for Star Wars Insider Magazine and a science communicator here in San Diego. It was so exciting to be back in person at a convention. James did a great job hosting this panel, and I was on it, which was super cool. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoy the panel. Tonight we've got an all-star panel of all kinds of ologists. Um, and why don't we just have them introduce themselves, uh, just say who you are and uh, what you do professionally, and how does Star Wars overlap with uh, your professional passion? Uh, we'll start at the end with Frank. Hello, my name is Frank Santana. I'm a herpetologist at the San Diego Natural History Museum, so another cool place for you to stop and check out Belleville Park. Um, and I've always been into weird, kind of interesting creatures because of Star Wars, and like reptiles and amphibians are kind of weird, interesting creatures in real life, so uh, it really inspired me to kind of take interest in those kind of often understudied creatures, and uh, Star Wars and herpetology have a lot in common, so it's fun to talk about them and nerd out. Herpetology, by the way, is the study of amphibians and reptiles. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Dr. Lisa Will. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at San Diego City College, and I'm the resident astronomer at the Fleet Science Center. Uh, I saw Star Wars in 1977, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> My name is Ahmed Patel, and I'm a vision and near scientist at the University of California, San Diego. And I've really always been interested in Star Wars, and there's a lot of overlap between eyes, which are really prominent in the aliens, and um, like, so, uh, my name is Fawn Davis. I've been in the motion picture and television industry for over three decades. Um, I do mostly miniature visual effects and uh, work with a lot of people that blow things up. <laughs> uh, I also grew up on Star Wars, and that actually led me to my career, which um, it kind of came full circle because I actually did get to work on the Star Wars special editions and the prequels and then most recently the Mandalorian, so. My name is Melissa Miller. I'm a science communicator. I'm also a volunteer at the Fleet Science Center and I basically just can't turn off my love for wildlife and biology and stuff. So when I'm watching anything, I'm thinking about the animals. Um, and I always love that in Star Wars, you know, to set a scene, you know, George Lucas, like, oh, small critter, you know, scurries by kind of thing. So that always caught my uh, interest. And I also, I now write articles about sort of the science of uh, Star Wars for Star Wars Insider. I think everyone on this panel has been a source for an article um, for me, or um, now James and I are doing the Star Wars Ologies podcast, um, where we just, yeah, we love overthinking uh, this intersection of academia and Star Wars. Yeah, basically, if you like this panel, you'll love our podcast. Every every uh, episode, we have a different expert on in their field of study, and we dive into where their their field of study and the galaxy far, far away meet up. Um, so let's give a hand for our panel. And as Lisa mentioned, I'm James Floyd. I'm moderating this panel. That's exciting. Um, I. Uh, write for StarWars.com as a freelancer and also Star Wars Insider Magazine. And let's go down with something cool. Uh, this is for Amit and Frank. Uh, what clues do you get about predators versus prey species just based on the characteristics that you see, the, the eyes or their body types? Um, and let's throw some uh, very cute uh, <laughs> predator and prey here. So for me, as an ecologist, also, you know, you kind of think about the interactions between animals and, you know, the sizes of them is a really big cue on who's a predator and who's a prey, right? So 
and the Mandalorian, um, Grogu seems to be a predator of anything smaller than itself. It's almost like a frog, right? A frog in real life will eat anything it can stuff into its mouth that's, you know, smaller than it. So, Gro <laughs> Grogu is definitely a predator in a lot of instances. And if you remember, I think it's in one of the early episodes of season one of Mandalorian, he ate a frog, he just downed it, right? Like, he really enjoyed it and downed it. But the second time he encountered a frog, that frog looked a little bit different. So, if you notice, it's kind of hard to tell from that picture, but the frog has a lot of bright coloration on its body. And that bright signaling is like uh, a way to communicate with the predator that you're poisonous. So this frog in The Mandalorian is poisonous, and in the show, Grogu is um, kind of teased by the kids when he like, half swallows the frog, but you know he would have downed it. He wasn't worried about uh, you know, what the other kids thought of him. He spit it out because it's poisonous, so like it's an ecologist and looking at that patterning. And in real life, you see these really amazing bright colors on these frogs, and that's a signal that they're poisonous. So these tropical species that live in South America, they have these bright colors and that warms them that they're poisonous. And so you kind of see that uh, analogous uh, pattern going on with the Mandalorian and Grogu. Pretty cool stuff. Yes, and besides the size and the coloration, the eyes actually give you a really good idea of whether a species is a predator or prey. Usually, a uh, predator species will have their eyes facing forward like in the front of their face. Um, so that will allow them to basically judge distance as you see. They're the predator looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, having two forward facing eyes allows uh, an animal to basically judge distance, like how far away their prey is. Now, uh, prey creatures actually have their eyes more on the sides of their head, which give them much bigger peripheral vision, so they can quickly scan like, the horizon to see if there's any predators coming after them. Uh, the second thing that um, tells you kind of how the, uh, whether the predator or prey is the shape, or the, just the orientation of the pupils. Usually prey have uh, horizontal pupils, which allows them to quickly scan the horizon more, whereas a predator species will have more vertical um, pupils, kind of like a cat, like cat's cat -like cat -like pupils. And that allows them to focus light better and also really kind of pinpoint where their prey is and fo like only focus on that. So if Grogu is a predator, I mean, that also means Yoda is a predator, right? Can we assume that he moved to that swamp planet because it's full of delicious frogs? Or we've always wondered. Yeah, when Luke was eating those like sticks, those little fish sticks, right? You know, from his metal box, it was like the rations of the military gave him, that the rebellion gave him. He really wanted to eat some fresh food. And so like, I think Yoda was willing to like take him home and feed him. And you know, they were eating some kind of local fauna probably that was boiling yeah. in that pot, yeah. Maybe fog lights or something? Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna throw up a, a couple of uh, different aliens and, and want you guys, you know, or anyone chime in on what you think, how they fit into the ecosystem. Uh, let's go with uh, this guy, Mahonic, the pod racer. So what, having multiple eyes, yeah, that's gotta be a crazy issue, right? Yeah, it seems like a good defense, especially with the eyes on the side, right? You can kind of look around and watch out for predators, so it's probably on his home planet, maybe he, there's a lot of big organisms that are trying to eat him, so it's a good defense against prey, or predators. You can also see from his teeth, they're kind of flat, so it's more like a, wait, that's a little type animal? This is a carnivore, which would have sharp teeth. So lower on the food chain, there's something bigger and badder with sharp teeth that wants to eat it. It's a good thing he's a pod racer pilot then, because he can get away. <laughs> Sorry, I, just, I just see Danny Wagner, which is the, the uh, buddy of mine that got to play this character in the model shop. <laughs> 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 Did did, now, did he think about it? You know, the, what's, this, his, what's his motivation? He's, a, he's a, basically a cow with three eyes. We were all talking about that on the I think he's just excited to be playing a uh, creature in Star Wars. It was very, uh, very fun. <laughs> All right, what about these guys? <laughs> yeah. So, we oh. got Gungans here. Oh, so they're, they look like a mixture of predator and prey species. So they have the big forward facing eyes. And I don't know if you, in, in the movie, you can see that they were really good at catching, at least Jar Jar, like he shot his tongue out and caught like something that was flying around. I don't know what it was. 
but um, that indicates that he's kind of a predator species, right? He's got a quick tongue, kind of like a frog. You catch things out of the air. Um, Yes, and I think there's some adaptations there too, right? So like the way their eyes can move. Um, if you think about, you know, their Duncans, they live underwater in the, the city underwater, and in that scene where there's these big monsters that come out to try to, you know, eat the smaller fish. So I think, it, in reality, things don't fit in that box so easily, right? Whether they're predator and prey, things can be in the middle, right? So there's organisms that can be um, both predators and prey, depending on the situation. So. Um, I think they kind of maybe fit in the middle where there's something bigger than that that they have to worry about, but they also are good hunters to survive. Well, uh, speaking of, of Naboo and its you know, diverse ecology and all that wildlife, uh, how could a planet like Naboo work with that watery core? And uh, what other types of things that we might see on planets that we usually don't see in Star Wars planets, but on, on real planets with maybe different atmospheres or, or whatnot? You still think there's so many things. There we go. Yeah, there. All right, so I have to admit that watery core always kind of disturbs me just a little, but uh, you can have liquids underneath the surface. So in our own solar system, on moons of Jupiter and Saturn, we have evidence of large bodies of water underneath icy, uh, icy surfaces. So having subsurface water doesn't, isn't a problem, actually. It's the subsurface water, this amount of it, on a rocky planet that is a little bit more problematic, but there's probably a way we could actually get it to work because we do see uh, the phase that a material is is dependent on the pressure and the temperature that it's experiencing, and so we could get that happening. And actually, one of the places in the solar system that is most likely to have life if we were to search for it would be these subsurface oceans of moons like Europa and Enceladus and, and other worlds in the, in the outer solar system. Well, this is one that you worked on, right? Yeah, that's me, underwater. Um, <laughs> awesome. Awesome. This, is, this is how I experienced the science of Star Wars from my personal perspective. <laughs> uh, this was actually really interesting because we shot this using a, a, a technique called dry for wet. So we built that whole set out, and you can see there's aluminum foil. It's not the store-bought stuff, but it's a thicker version of it. And then we would dress it, and then we would fog up the stage, and we would light it in the same way that you would uh, experienced light in the ocean, so all the light was from above, and then we created atmosphere with fog machines um, to make it feel like you're under water. And so we had, um, they call them kookaloruses, there's these light filters that kind of break up the light from the top, just the way the, the water surface would break up light. So those, those are the kinds of things that we would think of in creating these, these uh, unusual worlds. Did you say Kukaloris? Kukaloris, yes. That could be the name of an alien. you got to use that. That's a cookie for short. <laughs> they don't taste good, though. They don't taste good. All right. Um, I don't, are there any other favorite models that you worked on that you can kind of tell the design influence, uh, maybe inspired by different things? Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, when we worked on the Star Wars movies, George Lucas had a very, very clear vision of how we were to build and design things, and that was um, that you have to be able to recognize what it is within a couple seconds. And so every design in Star Wars is something you can recognize almost immediately, what you're looking at. If, it, if, it, if you did things to be cool or to be different and it ventured too far away from something that you could recognize, then he wouldn't uh, approve the design. So. Um, we had a lot of fun with this movie, but it was very complicated. This scene here, actually, if you go back to that, like, there are considerations that we have to take uh, into account when we're making these movies that you would just never imagine being so complicated. I remember this scene here with the hallway um, was very, very complicated because it was a miniature. It's hard to keep everything in focus. So we had to shoot this scene. Uh, the, the model came apart in sections, so every time you see an arch, that's a different section of the model. And when we shot that, we had to shoot the front section and then put a piece of velvet over it and then over and cover everything in the back. And then we had to take away the front section and shoot the second section and then the third and fourth section. We had to shoot them all separately just so everything can be in focus. And then they would composite all those scenes back together. So, and of course, while you're doing all that, none of, none of the elements of the model can move. So, it was, uh, 
that, that very simple shot actually ended up being really complicated. And that's, that's one of those things we didn't discover until we actually got it out on stage and started to try to shoot it. Yeah. How did you shrink Ewan McGregor to fit in the model? <laughs> that was in the computer. <laughs> He's in a computer? They, they shrink him in a computer, oh, yes. That makes total sense. So anyway, yes, if you want the real science of Star Wars, go into computer science. <laughs> I really like the insight that George Lucas had that plan, right? That things should be relatively quickly recognizable. I feel like that's how all of us are here today. It's not totally wild, we could never think of this. It's like, oh, that's got an element of a frog. That's got an element of a bird. I recognize what we're doing here. Because uh, that's why Star Wars, I've always found Star Wars so accessible, but still fantastic. Yeah, I think that's why it's so interesting to hear you guys talk about the wildlife and how uh, real rules of wildlife apply to fictional creatures. And I think that is because there was so much uh, effort to draw from reality when creating all these alien worlds. Yeah, so one of the, the cool things about wildlife, who here likes porgs? Come on! Okay, there we go. <laughs> so let's talk about porgs for a second. Yeah, We're going Jake. back really fast. The, the there we go. Is broken, so. oh, no, there we go. <laughs> porgs, they, they can nest anywhere. And by the end of The Last Jedi, the Resistance fleet is 100%, all of their ships are crewed by porgs. <laughs> I like this alternate reality. What? There's yeah. only one ship, so. Oh, dark. Yeah, James billed me as a porkologist in this panel, and I guess I'm close enough to it. Uh, so one of the, the first article I wrote for Star Wars Insider Magazine was about porgs, because this was really my first seeing The Last Jedi. I grew up in a bird-watching household. My brother is a, an ornithologist, uh, studies birds for a living, and we went to bird camp and all this stuff. And the first thing I saw, was, the only thing I saw really while watching The Last Jedi was, oh, those are puffins. This fills the same idea as puffins, and sure enough, Acto was, is what, Skellig Michael? Skellig Michael in Ireland. It's off the coast of Ireland, which is a seabird uh, preserve when they're nesting. And so they were all in the background of the shot, so, so they decided to, to work them in. And I had the great fortune of interviewing Jake Lund Davis, who is the concept artist behind Pork. So this is some of his, um, and what you were just showing, was some of his early sketches for something to do. And I love the idea that there's like the bat sort of flaps and and, and some of them had a bill, so that's really the big difference between porgs and puffins that I learned was the bill. So puffins use that huge bill that they have to burrow uh, and nest underground because they have aerial predators like gulls and, and other animals will come and eat their eggs and eat their babies, so they, so they do underground. Whereas porgs, in this concept art, it didn't make it into the movie, you know, if they have aerial predators and yet they don't burrow because they don't have that bill, so they can't burrow, but it also means something about them. Right, seabirds that that lay their eggs out in the open, even if they're predators, are usually very aggressive. So maybe that's why they've got these little teeth. We don't ever see it, and they seem quite tame around, you know, the Jedi's and the fish nuns and stuff. <laughs> There's but maybe the teeth. they're super aggressive. There you go. I think yeah, Jake also gets down into it. I love, uh, you know, he's not a biologist or anything like that, but he said he was watching up David Attenborough specials to really think about the biology of these these creatures that he creates. Um, the other thing, and my favorite fact that I learned while writing this uh, article about porgs, is that there are also seabirds that if they're not aggressive, they still, an aerial predator comes down, and they'll actually fly away, but first, they poop all over their eggs, so that it smells so bad, no one will want to eat them. And so, you know, just think about that the next time you watch The Last Jedi. <laughs> That's so, speaking of eggs, uh, you know, there, we know there's a, a favorite Star Wars character out there who really likes eggs. Um, uh, wait, wait, who are you guys talking about? Um, of course, we're, we're talking about Grogu, Baby Yoda. You know, we're, we, there's a lot we can talk about with him. Um, but let's talk about Frog Lady. Uh, she's an amphibian, but she's also sentient. So, what do you think that means, Frank? Yeah, so the Frog Lady is a very evolved type of amphibian, right? So she walks bipedally, um, she can communicate pretty well um, with other more sophisticated life forms. But if you think about the evolution of this, you know, frog lady, she's still tied to her past, her evolutionary past, right? So just like, you know, as mammals, we have traits that um, our mammal ancestors had before us and, you know, more, more evolved, our brains are bigger, but we still kind of have a lot of similarities with things like chimps and things like that, right? So the frog lady, no matter, you know, she's trying to, she's very evolved,
but she's still an amphibian. So one of the big things about amphibians is that they really need to stay moist at all times, and especially their eggs. So their eggs are not, they're not like a chicken egg. They have their um, water can penetrate back and forth through them. They have to be in really specific environmental conditions, so like the pH and everything has to really be um, suited to support those eggs. And so she has to carry her eggs in this canister to make sure that they're always moist. And even though she's like one of the last of her species, um, she really has to make sure that those eggs are held in that very kind of like specific conditions at all times. So it kind of limits her ability to reproduce. And this technology, you know, because of Star Wars, she's figured out a way to transport her eggs in a way that keeps them at this stable condition. She just has to watch out for predators like Grogu, who will <laughs> mack on those eggs as quickly as they can. And those eggs don't really have a defense, and it's kind of cool because in real life there are some frog species where the, the females will hang out with the eggs and protect them from predators. Sometimes the males will do it, so it's parental care, right? So this is like an advanced kind of feature of parental care in uh, the frog lady. So it's really cool to see that. So something like this, you transport frog eggs in real life? Yeah, so it, it's, what's crazy was that uh, while these episodes were coming out last year, I was doing this in real life with the California red-legged frogs down in Baja California, Mexico. It's an endangered species of frog that we moved frog eggs from Mexico and crossed the border at customs. We had to claim the frog eggs and drove them across and we put them in a couple sites in Southern California, in San Diego and Riverside. So it was like... You know, art imitating life or vice versa. It was so cool to see, like, you know, every week a new episode would come out. Like, I'm the frog lady. You know, I was moving <laughs> these eggs. And, and we kept them in these coolers. And they were temperature controlled. And we had little air bubblers. And made sure the water chemistry was perfect. Um, so I need a frog lady tattoo. I think that's the next one. <laughs> Thank you. So one, one of my favorite creatures in Star Wars are the Jawas. Are any Jawa fans out there? All right, we've got some. The rest of you should be Jawa fans. Um, Ahmed, explain those eyes. <laughs> yeah, so Jawa have cool eyes because they glow, right? And most animals don't usually have glowing eyes. Um, now, there is some basis for that in that there are some animals, like, in like our world that can sometimes have glowing eyes. One of those is the cat. I don't know if you know, it's like when it's like dark or you shine a light at a cat, those, those eyes like reflect back a ton of light. So a lot of like these smaller mammals have this extra feature in their eye, um, which is very reflective. So that helps them to balance light exposure. And um, what's really cool is that reindeer who live in Arctic, right? actually there's other, um, and when they live in extreme environments, they can actually change their eye color, like the inside of their eye to reflect out or absorb light. And so reindeer in the Arctic in the summertime when there's a lot of light, too much light exposure can actually damage your eyes. So they, they turn their eyes golden. So when you look at them, they have like a golden glow. And that reflects out a lot of the light back out into their environment so they can see better. But in the winter when it's dark, usually it's like all the time, they change their eyes to become blue and that absorbs more light and allows them to see in these darker environments. So um, maybe the Jawas are, have some, something similar to that because they live in the desert and there's a lot of light. So they have these yellow eyes that kind of reflect back out all that extra light so they can see. Cool. And Anakin reflecting out all the love. In this, you know, any love projected towards him, he's reflecting it back out. Well, and I definitely remember noticing, and this is just because, you know, I notice everything like this, that the Jawas in the Mandalorian series had red glowing eyes instead of yellow glowing eyes. And I wasn't sure, I, I of course, I'm like, oh, it's, they're on a different planet, and what could that mean? And it might just mean that the director of that episode thought red would be cooler, but I don't know. <laughs> no, well, the environment, like, so basically, the, like, the atmosphere can refract, refract light at, like, different things, so maybe they look red because... They're on a different planet, um, but also everything else looks different too. So I don't, uh, maybe just the eye that are special. Everything. What kind of other adaptations might creatures have when they go from one planet to another? What, what things do they have to uh, kind of compensate for when they go from one environment, one type of world, to something completely different? So that's a very interesting question because we don't see them really do it in Star Wars. 
right? We don't see them take into account what planet they're on very often. We don't tend to see them uh, wearing gas, you know, wearing masks, except for, you know, when they ended up being in the asteroid. But moving from planet to planet, there's there's atmospheric contact uh, content. There's difference in gravitational pull. Um, there's differences in atmospheric pressure. So there's all sorts of things that you would have to adapt to, which is why I just can't send you to Mars right now and have you be happy. And so what we see in the Star Wars universe is kind of interesting because our heroes seem to be happy everywhere. But that could actually have an implication though, right? It could be that the subtle worlds all have a very finite range of gravity, atmospheric content, and atmospheric pressure. That just could be a selection effect that we see them on worlds where it works for them. Yeah, I definitely remember noticing in Empire, right, when they're on the asteroid, that the only time they use is gas masks or, or whatever, and then, oh, I guess they use them again um, in uh, Force Awakens, but yeah, the, it's amazing how adaptive they are to every single planet. Is that something fun, like, think about when people overthink, or they're just like, ah, this will be easier? I actually think, well, I, I, I think... <laughs> I think Star Wars actually uh, it, it is a similar to Star Trek. A lot of the alien species are just based on humans because, of course, all the creatures are played by humans, so they have the human form. And it, it actually goes back to more of a budgetary issue with making movies than it does um, uh, uh, artistic creation. As the movies have continued into a more CG-filled uh, um, uh, VFX pipeline, then, then you start seeing the creatures really divert from humans, but... Sorry, that's a very boring answer, but that's the truth. No, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, some of the coolest wildlife is in the Clone Wars, I've noticed, you know, because they don't have to worry about how would we make this a practical effect or spend a bunch of time, um, you know, developing it, so... <laughs> but what, what about this character? He's also someone in mind. I hear they taste good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did, did you get to work on the uh, or the, the Quacky Monkey Lizard prop for Mando? Oh no, no. no. that was uh, I think that was Legacy. Okay. Uh, can Thank you talk you. about some of the stuff you did work on for Mando? Um, we did uh, we did a lot of pig droids and then a lot of ice spiders. A lot of ice spiders. <laughs> <laughs> How Which many? Again? I, I've had a lot of people um, complain about. It. <laughs> it's like their least favorite episode because it was terrifying. Because there's thousands of spiders in it. That was one of my favorites because there were so many spiders in it and just, you know, went full scary movie running and, there, you know, you can't stop. I and definitely found out like friends were that had arachnophobia. Yeah, no, that was not my favorite. It's like, there's what, but there's a Harry Potter movie, there's a Doctor Who episode, there's always big spiders in every, you know, sci-fi fandom or whatever it feels like. But actually, I, for once, I was on the side of the ice spiders because here they are just like hanging out, being face hugger eggs. You know, enjoying their nice little pool of, of warm water. And again, Grogu comes in and starts eating one, right? It's not how they all get started. And I and you know, they're just minding their own business and then they all get killed. So Yeah, that, this is what happens when you introduce invasive species and into an environment. It just throws everything out of whack. And pretty soon you got flames shooting everywhere. That's not natural to a big ice cave environment. I don't know, what can we do about ice cave environments, you know, that, that uh, I don't know. Are they a thing? Do we have ice caves? Here on Earth. Anywhere. Sure. sure. I don't think they're full of spiders, I don't think. <laughs> no, I don't think they have, but those, which would be kind of interesting, but yeah, ice caves are, a, that's a perfectly viable environment. That's not one of those things that I would look at in an episode and go, wait, that can't happen. That's not a problem. What, what type of life, besides giant spiders, do you think we'd have in an ice cave? Like, what adaptations might we need? There's probably a lot of, like, microbes, a lot of smaller things that you don't see. If you think about, like, the Arctic, um, under the ice shelves, there's, you know, plankton and things like that. These kind of really cool, like, invertebrates. And uh, so probably a lot of diversity that can live in these niches. So in these extreme environments, you can still get um, organisms that can survive, they just survive in a different way and uh, might have very different like body forms and things. I mean, that's where we're looking for ice now, is that right, Lisa? In terms of ice worlds or...? Well, what's interesting to me is that the study of extremophiles here on Earth has basically opened up a whole field called astrobiology, that there's all sorts of environments that we're finding on Earth 
that creatures can survive in, and so why can't they? I mean, I, I think the, the answer is that there's probably a lot more survivable environments out there than we would have previously thought based on what we now see on Earth that my, my fine biology friends understand better than I do. But what's funny for me is that as I talk about the environments we see in space and the chemical forms that we see there, like nitrogen, ice, and carbon dioxide, like ices and stuff that exist in different phases naturally in space than they do here on Earth, they get some of my chemistry and biology friends excited because they're like, we didn't know that existed out there. That could be a possibility for this sort of, you know, extremophile. So that, that to me is the fun crossover between the life sciences and the physical sciences when we look out in space. Exactly. You can end up with things like space slugs that can live in one of the most hostile environments out there and you can have a giant, giant space slug. Yeah, no, that's one of the articles that I wrote was about the space slugs and other animals that lived outside the atmosphere. So the pergils from Rebels as well. And, and I, I think Frank said it, the, every bacteria, right? That's what we're going to find is like uh, other places. And even here on Earth, bacteria makes so many of these things possible that seem, you know, like science fiction on screen, like the Minox feeding off of electricity. There are actually bacteria on Earth that feed off of electricity. Um, the space slug, you know, burrows down into the asteroid, sort of just like tendrils, and becomes part of the rock. There are bone, there are worms that that feed on bones that you'll find, like a whale fall at the bottom of the ocean, just covered in worms. Um, you know, so so again, that whole life finds a way. Bacteria at least finds a way. Well, one of the environments I'm pretty sure that most life forms can't live in are explosions. <laughs> that, uh, it's mostly because explosions happen pretty quick, so to evolve into that might be tough, but I know somebody here is really good about talking about explosions. Yeah, actually, uh, he, um, he got to blow up ships for a living, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's actually, this photo is great, because this is from the first pyro shoot that I've ever worked on. It was with a pyro technician named Jeff Heron. A friend of his is in here, from 3210. <laughs> that's where Jeff Heron is now. Um, but anyway, so Jeff, I learned a lot about pyro from Jeff Heron and his team. We would build models that they would then blow up. Um, and in this one was the first time I ever worked a pyro shoot. It was absolutely uh, amazing. Because you see these explosions in movies and they're, you know, they're very dramatic and they're very loud and um, just cinematically exciting. And so we, we set up to do this shot. We uh, loaded up the model with pasta is a thing. So uh, it's a lot of science that goes into the uh, filming of explosions. Jeff Heron and his team would plan everything to the millisecond. We would pre-break the model on the inside so we knew exactly how it was going to break and where debris was going to fly to the best of our knowledge. Um, there were a lot of things that we'd have to test. Like um, a lot of, there's a formula for how much, um, how many frames per second to shoot an explosion. There's several formulas actually, you'll find them on, on if you Google them. Um, and I famously asked Pat Sweeney, one of our cinematographers, um, about those formulas, and he said there's a lot of those formulas, but um, they're all wrong. Because <laughs> basically what we would do is we'd shoot a lot of tests and we'd just pick the speed that looked best. Um, but anyway, so we planned these things to the millisecond, and Jeff described we're going to blow up this ship and the front of it's going to explode, pasta's going to go everywhere. We used pasta because you had to really pack these things with debris, because debris would fly past the camera so quickly that you wouldn't actually see it. So we ended up loading a lot more debris than you would actually ever see on camera just to make sure that there was some debris that would make it onto the final uh, frames of the explosion. Um, and, and pasta was a really inexpensive, fast way to do it. We could break up pieces and spray paint it and pour them into the model. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so when we shot this, he, he described this three-stage explosion. There was going to be fire coming out of the windows. All this amazing stuff, and I was ready for it. I was on set, and I was just going to turn on the model lights and turn them off uh, because we were running 12 volt lights at 36 volts, which means they'd only last about 20, 20 minutes instead of years like a light bulb should last. And that was to create enough light to film this explosion because, again, the science of it if you're shooting high speed, you need a lot of light for every single frame because it goes by so quickly, right? So, um, We'd light these things up very, very bright, much brighter than you would imagine. Um, anyway, so we're shooting on film. Pat fires up the camera, and it's screaming because this is a film camera. It's what we shot everything on film at this time. It's very, very loud, so he's yelling over it. It was very, very exciting. And he said, 
roll camera, and then it's screaming, and then he says, speed, and then he says, action, and then there was a pop. <laughs> Just the tiniest little pop sound, and then the model was gone. <laughs> and I looked at Jeff and I said, did that work? And he goes, I don't know, we'll see in the morning. <laughs> We had to develop the film, you know, so... So, and, so and that sure was enough, just one take? That was one take, yeah. And, and I, had th I had thought something went horribly wrong because it was just sounded like a firecracker, just kind of a pop sound, and, and the model was gone, and there was stuff everywhere, but I didn't see anything. I didn't see a three-stage explosion with fire. Um, and then, sure enough, in the morning, because it, it was shot at high speed, um, Flames came out of the window, and then the ship broke apart, and there were three distinct fireballs, and, you know, that, that shot's in the movie. <laughs> but without the sound effects, and when you're there, and you're shooting high speed, it doesn't seem like anything. So that was my first experience with pyro, um, <laughs> and blowing up models. It was very unique, very, very cool to kind of see how much work went into just that uh, couple seconds of footage, and how even less of a second that time uh, it took to shoot it. You know, it was just amazing. All right, we're going to uh, start audience Q&A. We have a microphone up front. But uh, Lisa, tell us a little bit about real world explosions and you know, if, if we s do they blow up as fast as a pop or do they last long like the explosions we see in movies? Well, once again, that's going to depend on what's exploding, what's your accelerant, what's in the atmosphere around it. Um, if the atmosphere is actually uh, dense enough for, to actually carry sound, to make it, you know, I always remember in space no one can hear you scream, right? And so that's actually true, the lower density, the atmosphere, the less sound you're going to have. So um, explosions can have a huge range. What color they're going to be is going to depend on what's exploding in the atmosphere that they're in. So you actually do have a lot of leeway to play with explosions. Uh, and, and I know we need um, an accelerant, and we always think of flame as needing oxygen. So the way I justify the explosions in space in my head is like, well, the oxygen or whatever air was in the spaceship is, is, is there for it to feed upon during the moment of the explosion itself. So you don't have to worry about that. At least that's how I can wave that away for myself. <laughs> All right, uh, first question right there. Hello, uh, thank you for hosting the panel, by the way. Uh, my name's Ricky, and I was just wondering, how would a sarlacc work? I mean, they digest their prey over a thousand years. I mean, that, or supposedly. I mean, oh, but evidently sur survived, of course. But, you know, spoiler alert. You know, thank you. Sarlacc, there's, go for it. There's actually insects. There's a, there is a species of insect that kind of, as a larva, during the larval stage, they make a little burrow, and they're called ant lions and the ants or other insects that walk on top, it kind of just senses that and it goes and gobbles them up. So maybe it's just like a, a bigger scale version of that. Maybe the sarlacc will metamorphose into something beautiful. Maybe it becomes a beautiful butterfly or something. Um, so maybe it's a life stage that you know takes a long time and then it's um, gonna maybe go do something else. That's the first thing that came to mind for me. And then like a carnivorous plant too, something like that, you know? Right, so like the digestive juices, yeah. yeah. As a reward for uh, asking a question, we've got uh, Jake Blunt Davis drew some sketches. So uh, giving those uh, away to those uh, people in line asking questions. So enjoy. All right, who's next? Hello there. Hello there. Um, I wanted to ask how likely it is that a galaxy would evolve with diverse life and multiple climates, and yet every planet in that galaxy only contains one biome. <laughs> Oh, so you're talking about the whole monoclimate thing, right? Right. So what I find really interesting about that is that we see monoclimates in our own solar system, you know. But uh, so like there are there are the ice moons out in the, in the solar system, and so the way I always think of it in my head is that monoclimates can actually exist, but they're usually on small worlds. And if they're on small worlds, they have lower gravity typically. And if they have lower gravity, people like you and I are just not going to be moving the, and evolving the same way we are here. So for me, it's not so much the climates that are the problem, it's the way we see the creatures on them behaving that's the problem. But monoclimates, go for it. That's fine with me. <laughs> Good question. Thank you. All right, who do we have next? Hello. Hi. Um, so my question is kind of a biolog biology one. Is there anything that would indicate whether a creature or whether a, um, a creature is indigenous to that planet or that environment 
or whether they have been transplanted there, and do you see any creatures that indicate that in Star Wars? So it makes me think about invasive species. We kind of talked about invasive species, and um, you know, in on here on Earth, there's a lot of different niches, right? So like there is certain bacteria that live on human feet and only on human feet, right? So like, that's pretty amazing to have this little niche. So there's a lot of, there's a broad spectrum of things that are specialized versus things that are more generalized. So looking just at the movie and the creatures, it's hard to say whether something is native or whether it was from somewhere else, but um, is that kind of getting at your question? Well, I just was wondering if there's any things that indicate, that would indicate that, hey, there's no way that that, that speech, that, that species would be in that environment because of, you know, so they must have been, I, what brought the, what brought the question to me was the um, Jawas and their eyes, the red and the, the yellow. And I'm thinking, well, if they were transplanted, if they were brought over and they were not indigenous to that environment, they could have evolved to have red eyes versus the yellow. Right. And, you know. yeah. yeah, and I think there is evolution in Star Wars universe, right? Because you kind of see these like subtle kind of differences uh -huh. between different ones. So maybe there were some kind of like pressures from evolution and uh, that caused them to kind of have those subtle differences. Yeah, but there's nothing, there's nothing that would scream out to you that, oh, no, 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 this would... I mean, there's certainly for the characters, maybe not as much as the wildlife, but there's certainly, like, you know, Jedi Master uh, Plo Kloon or something like that, right? He's got the goggles and the... He's clearly not, you know, meant to... His home planet is very different, yeah. you know? And, and there's lots of those with the characters, I feel like. Um, some of the wildlife is, is a bit more interchangeable. I mean, there's... We project onto it the Earth things. Yeah. You know, there's the desert creatures sort of out in the desert um, and, and that, but uh, I, was all, I always think about Dagobah, just it being this really rich place, you know, big animals and lots of animals yeah. because there's the canopy, there's the swamps and all of that, and that's very analogous to, you know, swamps and, and, and the rainforest here on Earth. Um, so I, I definitely see it pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, when they show the animals just skittering across in every scene, it seems like something that should be on that planet specifically. Going back to the monoclimate question too, um, it's easy it's easy to sort of figure that adaptation out. If your entire planet is desert, you should adapt to the desert. You know, our only things that adapt to the desert um, are going to survive. Well, one of the things that sticks out to me is definitely not native are banthas on Tatooine because they are big, hairy things. You know, the hair is good for sifting out sand, but that's got to be really heavy and hot, and they're big. Um, and, and one of the things that we see on lots of planets are these big monster creatures, wampas and stuff. They're at the top of the food chain. There's not a whole lot further down the, the food chain. There's, there's tauntauns, and they eat lichen, so how are they getting enough energy to be tauntauns? How are they, there's enough tauntauns for wampas to eat? Makes you wonder, were they introduced maybe a long time ago, and just some just happened to survive? Also, if you see this, like the same or similar species on multiple different planets, they probably have been introduced somehow. They probably didn't originally come from there, since they came from like probably like a starter planet. Um, that's another way you can kind of tell if they naturally belong there or not. Yeah. That always threw me off too with Jar Jar being able to live underwater and, you know, above on all these different, you know, live in the, the world, you know, the city planet. Um, that's some serious general adaptations, I feel like. There. There's not a lot of that probably, Frank, right? Like, uh, and newts don't uh, thrive in our cities, I assume. Yeah, a lot of like amphibians are really tied to the water. Even though the ones that can move a little further away, they're still like only active during like wet and rainy periods. So they might be able to survive in more extreme environments, but their uh, ability to sort of um, actively be up and about is limited. All right, hi. Um, I wanted to know from uh, your, in your in your opinion, we know that from Star Wars and like. Um, Mr. Sorry, forgot the name. Uh, it's the model. Person. Oh, fine. Uh, you said that the reason we use humanoid aliens is because humans play them. Um, but in your opinion, do you think that in real life, um, extraterrestrials would be realistically humanoid? Uh, at least intelligent. Do you think they would be humanoid, or do you think that it just completely depends on whatever environmental or ecosystem uh, they developed in? Nowhere near my level of expertise. But, uh... I think as humans, we put an anthropocentric spin on everything, so that means we're focused on like everything else 
is probably human, right? We kind of have that bias where we kind of like think aliens are going to be other humanoid things, but they could be, you know, more closely related to the bacteria that live on our bodies than they are to um, us, our higher organism. I, I, I'm not an expert, but I will say that um, it, if you look at an octopus, for example, they're very, very intelligent, they're very uh, capable creatures, and that just makes me think, and they, you couldn't get more away from a human than an octopus. <laughs> so it, it, it seems like you would just adapt to your environment. Uh, and, and the uh, different alien species would just be uh, adapted to wherever they're from. And they could be anything. That's kind of the exciting thing about exploring the universe. Yeah. Now, in the underwater uh, worlds definitely give us that sort of insight, too. I talked, when I talked to the, the concept artist, he was like, it's so hard to draw fish that are aliens, you know, the fish that he drew for Acto in The Last Jedi. Because if you watch, you know, Blue Planet, fish basically already are aliens. You know, there's eyes everywhere, there's just all these crazy adaptations, so who knows what anything's going to look like. So I certainly like it better when uh, there's the non-humanoid ones. Sometimes it's still a practical effect. Like there's a human in there, but they, you know, cheat things a little bit here and there, so that it really looks very different. I'm always most interested in those aliens. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um... So in a few of the movies and shows, they've shown creatures that live in like the vacuum of, vacuum of space and eat like gas or some other thing. Is there any science to support a creature like that even potentially existing? So that's a really interesting question because um, I think the answer a few decades ago would have been no, but uh, there is at least one species or one type of bacteria called Dinococcus radiodurans, which can actually exist in space. Uh, they've done uh, tests on it on the uh, International Space Station. And NASA actually uh, attempts to decontaminate its spacecraft before launching them so as not to introduce an invasive species because we are finding out that things can actually exist in more extreme conditions. Now, we're talking about really you know, simple, tiny bacteria in this case, but I think perhaps that means you can't get the pergill you know, from rebels, which is the best star world. I had to get that in. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> and also, given enough time, these small creatures, like, they can evolve into multicellular organisms, like, over, like, thousands, like, millions of years. So, it's possible that, you know, from the small bacteria, if you look at that, like, a couple million years later, that thing can turn into, like, a space lugger or something. Space lugger. Oh, yeah. Great, thank you. Hi, I love the crystalline boxes from Last Jedi, and I was wondering if you could talk about the plausibility of such creatures. And if I could request a BB-8 from uh, from Jake, that would be awesome. <laughs> BB-8 with thumbs up, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, I love the crystal boxes. That was something that immediately I was into in the Last Jedi. Uh, in terms of that salt environment, yeah, that's. I, yeah, I don't really have any more. I love The Last Jedi because it's the only movie in Star Wars that we've seen science being done, which is when the dude does the whole salt thing right. when he tests it. Because when I, when I saw the trailer and I saw it kicking up that red material, I immediately thought of Halite. Yep. I'm like, oh, that's a world that's cast salt. Those are salt flats. And then he did salt. He's my favorite. So would the boxes also have the salt? Would that explain their body? Yep, they're exuding the salt, essentially. But, uh, yeah, actually, red salt is real. That's uh, no, normal table salt. Halite is uh, sodium chloride. Uh, the red salt is p potassium chloride. Uh, you can learn about that in our first episode of, of Star Wars Ologies. <laughs> um, you, can, you can kind of mention, or you can kind of imagine how the, uh, the, those might have fur on them and the crystals grow on right. the fur also. Yeah, I think that's always kind of yeah, that's kind of what I imagine, too. There's some sort of reason for them to coat themselves, maybe, in the salt. Um, yeah. They, they can dazzle predators by, by being all sparkly and blind them. All right, we got two more people. Uh, hello. So my question goes back on to microbes, specifically these things called mini chlorians. Um, so how is it that these mini chlorians create this symbiotic effect with humans where there is supernatural re uh, effect that happens within this symbiotic relationship. And 
how would they naturally choose who they want to be symbiotic with and give these supernatural powers to as a mini Love this question. I knew we'd get a mini Florian question. <laughs> yeah, there's that whole nature versus nurture, you know, like the idea, I, I admit it, the first time seeing it, I still haven't quite taken to the idea that that's how the force works. Um, but, you know, we've got all sorts of bacteria in us now. Maybe we're all beholden to our gut bacteria. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I certainly think it's possible. Maybe by giving its host a uh, uh, extra chance of survival by giving him superpowers that, or him or her, uh, superpowers might be the, the, like a means for their own survival. Yeah, so actually they think that the mitochondria in our cells actually a long time ago is like a symbiotic relationship with some kind of bacteria. So maybe that's the basis of midichlorians. Kind of sound the same. And if um, you think about it, some people have more ability to uh, have better oxygen in their you know, bloodstream. They can, you know, there's been selection pressures for them to be able to take in more oxygen or less oxygen. So maybe. maybe eventually people will, like, are about to kind of evolve into midichlorians and give us horsepowers too. And, and then Thank I, you, I appreciate you Yeah, I, I'm just going to say, I feel a little better about midichlorians now that we've seen, especially in the animated series, more force-sensitive creatures, not just the humanoid creatures, not just Jedi, so that it, it, it makes it seem a little less elitist than it came across to begin with. No, but it opens up so many questions, you know, can you collect midichlorians, can you, you know, dope with midichlorians, you know, I, we need a physiologist, I think, here for, for where that question goes. I would love to inject myself with some of these midichlorians if you guys are ready. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, uh, I'm just wondering, knowing what you know about um, creatures and their unique abilities and adaptations and things, is there anything that you would like to see in an alien in Star Wars that hasn't been done before? As someone who loves the ocean and works in oceanography a long time, more ocean planets, please. I loved that we got a little bit right in Mandalorian uh, with the Mon Calamari and their fishing sweaters. Uh, that cracked me up. But yeah, more ocean stuff is always what I is what I want to say. Having fun. I, I just want to know how they all know how to speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see that origin story. Right. <laughs> I think something based more on paleontology would be really cool, like something like fossilized that's this weird kind of creature that we've never seen in real life on planet Earth and kind of take that and run with it. be cool. All right, uh, anyone else want to answer that question? Okay, I'll give a final question to all of you. Um, do you ever feel like you are playing the role of a Star Wars character in any of your job fields, or is there a job in the Star Wars universe that you would want to have? Um, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I wish there were more naturalists in Star Wars, you know, just some more, you know, bird watchers or nature lovers, people who go on hikes. I guess when there's a galactic war going on, you know, there's more important things, but uh, I would love to see that uh, more. And I feel like it's a little bit of a stretch, but maybe Han Solo is the only glimmer we get of that. Uh, you know, he's on his ship, he's flirting with Leia, and then there's something going on. He's like, he knows the Minox, he knows what they are immediately. Maybe he knows every animal or planet he goes to because he loves in his free time to, to go Minox watching. I don't know, it's probably more just that it's a threat to his ship, and so of course he knows what it is and how to get rid of it, but that's, that's my idea. I think naturally for me, I would be on Fondor, uh, manufacturing Star Destroyers. <laughs> Oh, I particularly like the Jedi just because they're always studying the world, interacting with like creatures, learning about, and then being not diplomatic. But uh, you know, as a scientist, you kind of have to do all that kind of stuff. Right? You look at, you look for clues and everything, kind of piece together. Um, so yeah. Um, I actually once gave a talk wearing uh, my full Jedi outfit. Um, it was for uh, one of the. Uh, I think it was for the Rise of Skywalker premiere that we did at the Fleet Science Center, so I did a Worlds of Star Wars talk and I gave it in a Jedi outfit, and wow, do you feel powerful and competent when you do a Jedi outfit. I kind of think of the librarian from the prequels where she kind of is, you know, hanging out doing all her research. We do a lot of reading and, you know, it's not always exciting stuff outside, but um, I'm sure there's tons of cool natural history books in that library, so I would love to go there and hang out and learn. 
Well, you know, if you want to learn more about science, obviously, if you're here in San Diego, please check out the Fleet Science Center and thank them for sponsoring this panel. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, Melissa and I host a, a podcast where we talk about just these things. It's called Star Wars Ologies. You can find it on iTunes and other places. Um, let's give a big round of applause for our panel. All right, thank you one again. One, thank you once again for coming. Thanks so much to everyone who came out to Comic Con Special Edition and came to our panel. We had great questions, as you heard, and it was just really exciting to talk about the nerdy science of Star Wars, as you know, James and I love to do, and to find other people who also love to talk about it. So we did the panel in person, which means we had a slideshow going. There are a few visuals that you might want to check out. We put up the version on our YouTube page that has all of those slides if you want to check it out. Uh, there's one point where we're talking about a hallway, and that's on Camino. And there's all sorts of other really great slides that James put together to help you uh, know what we're talking about. So we want to thank the Fleet Science Center for hosting this panel at Comic-Con Special Edition. If you want to check them out on YouTube, their Fleet Science Center, F-L-E-E-T, Science Center, and their Fleet Science on Twitter and Instagram as well. If you're looking for our Comic-Con panelists' uh, social media information, you can find Fawn Davis at F-O-N-H Davis on Instagram and Twitter. Lisa Will can be found at at Dust Chick on Twitter. Frank Santana is at Boba Frank on Instagram. And of course, you can find Star Wars Ologies at Star Wars Ologies on Twitter and Instagram. And James is James Jawa. And I am Melissa Truth on Twitter. Give us a follow. We are part of the Skywalking Network, where you can find a variety of other great shows about Star Wars, Disney, and Marvel, including classic Marvel Star Wars comics, Resilience Squadron, and Skywalking Through Neverland. They also have a new YouTube show, Today in Star Wars History. You can find all of those shows on skywalkingnetwork.com. See you next time on Star Wars Ologies when we discuss air traffic control systems in Star Wars. Woo, Comic-Con!